creators of visual programming tools for software development, is pleased to provide major funding for the Computer Chronicles, the story of this continuing evolution. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffee, sitting in for Gary Kildall this week as Herb Lechner of SRI. Herb, we think of chess as the ultimate game of skill, a game that requires mental agility, intelligence, if you will. Yet here I am playing a game of chess with a computer, which is analyzing board positions and, and applying a certain kind of intelligence to figure out what its next move should be. That's the subject of our program today, artificial intelligence. And in, in some people's minds, AI suggests attempting to duplicate the way a human brain works. Is that what AI is, in fact? Uh, not in most modern AI research, uh, Stuart. Um, early research in AI looked at, at duplicating human thought processes, but current AI research is more concerned with duplicating the end result of intelligence. And uh, computers uh, that act as experts in expert systems and computers that can communicate with us in our language, understanding some of the context of that language, uh, are two areas that are receiving a lot of attention in artificial intelligence research today. Okay, we're going to meet two of the world's foremost experts on artificial intelligence, and we'll take a look at two fascinating examples of expert systems. One of the leading experts on expert systems is Dr. Edward Feigenbaum of Stanford University. We asked Professor Feigenbaum about the evolution of artificial intelligence. The um, computers, as you know, are general symbol processing devices capable of manipulating any kinds of symbols, of which numbers constitute one important class, but computers are much more general than that. We've known about the generality of computation since at least the time of uh, Turing in the 1930s, and actually I've tracked it back to um, intuitions that Babbage had that were reported by uh, Ada Lovelace, after whom the Ada programming language is named. In 1842, uh, Ada Lovelace wrote that uh, the analytical engine of Babbage has constituted the, the uh, link between the mechanical world and the world of the most abstract concepts. That currently, in the modern terminology, is called the physical symbol system hypothesis and is the basis for artificial intelligence work. In artificial intelligence as a science, we talk about the use of computers to process symbolic knowledge using logical inference methods, symbolic inference methods. In other, in other words, we're talking about uh, inference and not calculation in the traditional sense. We're talking about knowledge and not numbers in the traditional sense. A current application of inferential knowledge engineering is in the field of expert systems, programs like this oil exploration advisor. Developed to assist drilling rigs in remote areas, the program behaves much like a qualified specialist. It asks questions of its user and then gives advice on how to avoid or correct accidents so common in drilling operations. If at some point in the line of questioning the user becomes confused by the query, he can ask the program to explain itself simply by entering why. The advisor responds with a specific source behind the question and explains its reasoning up to that point. The symbolic processing behind the human-like talents of this program have found applications in a broad range of fields, from medicine to robotics. Perhaps the most difficult area for AI to master has been natural language, a talent that results in very friendly computers, but that requires enormous processing capacity. The ambiguities of syntax and context have restricted present systems to very limited applications. A simple geographic question, depending on the phrasing, can lead to multiple interpretations. The program will determine the question's most likely meaning only after an exhaustive deconstruction of the sentence and might even reject an unusual phrasing of the same query. In a parallel development, investing AI programs with linguistic ability has led to an interactive study of graphic communication. In this experiment, the visual dynamics of communication form the foundation for a linguistic expert advisor capable not only of discerning visual patterns, but also acting as a kind of tutor. One interactive application has given persons without normal speech the ability to adapt or construct alternative symbolic languages, a remarkable instance 
of using a computer program's intelligence to help interpret human intelligence. Joining us now is Jeffrey Perone. Jeffrey is a management consultant involved in expert systems for micros, and Niels Nielsen, director of the Artificial Intelligence Center at SRI International. Herb. Nils, could you kind of help us scope the field of artificial intelligence as it exists today? Well, I'll try, Herb. It's a broad field. If you ask uh, many of different people what constitutes artificial intelligence, I think you'd get a lot of different answers. Uh, for me, I think it concerns mainly the uh, putting of knowledge into computer programs so that the programs then can solve certain problems which humans are, uh, find uh, somewhat uh, easy or perhaps intellectual challenges sometimes. And the uh, knowledge that one puts in is a knowledge that's represented in, in a particular sort of way. So the idea is that it's just not smarter programs that do artificial intelligence uh, programming. It is some difference in techniques that they use relative to what ordinary programming. Well, there's a part of computer science that artificial intelligence is concerned with that does, in fact, involve a certain body of techniques that are a little different, perhaps, than uh, what goes on in the rest of computer science. Jeffrey, uh, Niels is involved in the research end of uh, AI, and you're involved in some of the applications. Are, are we at the point today where we can apply AI? Absolutely, Stuart. In what uh, ways? Well, I feel that uh, artificial intelligence, and specifically expert systems or knowledge-based systems, now are applicable any place that specialized knowledge is used routinely to reach decisions, troubleshooting strategies, diagnoses, those areas. So uh, I, I kind of think of it as something where uh, we've reached a watershed where it's no longer very expensive or very difficult for individuals with no technical background to build systems and apply them usefully. And you distribute a system uh, which is an expert system and also helps one build expert systems, is that correct? Right. Well, actually, it's a tool for generating particular expert systems applications in virtually any area where there is that routine use of special knowledge. And it runs on microcomputers. Right. It runs on the IBM personal computer and a number of other compatible microcomputers. Do you use the same techniques in this system that Nils was referring to or used in systems that might run on larger equipment? It uses some of the same ideas, and it uh, has its own unique uh, approach as well. One of the specific areas where this is a different sort of program is that instead of requiring explicit statement of rules, to build a system. It only requires examples of previous decisions, previous uh, tasks, previous diagnoses to build the systems. And that's going to uh, break through, I believe, the knowledge engineering bottleneck mentioned by people like Edward Feigenbaum in building these systems. Jeffrey, you have expert ease uh, your system up here and, and show us the demonstration. Sure. Okay. Well, this is a particular application generated with this system, and it was generated by an anesthesiologist, Hilary Don, and myself. And it, what it does is it makes diagnoses for breathing or airway problems. The first question here that it asks the naive user is, when was the onset of the problem? And I'll answer days. It then will ask, what's the quality of the strider, which is a rasping sound made when one's breathing, kind of a sort of sound. And let's say that the quality is moderate. Who would use this system, a doctor? Okay. Or this a might be used by a physician's assistant to screen patients for perhaps further fine-tuning by someone with more expertise. Is the patient drowsy? Let's say no. Are there any predisposing factors to developing strider, prior events that might lead to this condition? Let's say yes. And it comes up with, consider the diagnosis of intrathoracic tracheal stenosis. Now, I'm not a physician, so I don't know exactly what that means, but uh, that gives you an idea of how it might lead to a particular diagnosis. Now, what I'd like to do is I'd like to show you a trivial example called Sunday, which actually comes with the manual for the program as a tutorial, essentially. Now, Sunday is a, a model of deciding what to do on a Sunday afternoon. How are you going to spend your time? And uh, it is, consists of a couple of questions, multiple choice questions, like you've just seen. And uh, those would be answered. So now what I'm going to do is run the query system. And it asks, do you have your family with you? Let's say yes. What is the weather like? Is it raining or sunny? Let's say sunny. So it says, why don't you take the family to the beach? Now, the way that you would build one of these models is by starting on something called the attribute screen. The attribute screen 
is where you sketch out the dimensions of the particular problem or situation. Now here the attributes are weather and family and there's the advice column which would be the result of a particular decision. What, what size matrix can you, can you do on that? Okay, you can actually do uh, in any particular problem 31 attributes and up to 255 values per attribute and those can then be chained together so you can do very large models just uh, limited by the size of your disk storage essentially. The uh, values such as raining and sunny could be thought of as answers to the question represented by the attribute. Once you've done a preliminary sketch of this sort, you then go to something called the example screen. And on the example screen, you enter in examples of previous decisions. Now this was developed by Dr. Donald Mickey in Edinburgh based on the idea that information is communicated by experts or masters to their apprentices in the form of examples or cases. So here you see horizontally running across the screen uh, answers to those questions. Raining, yes, we're with the family, the advice would be go to the museum. And the next case would be if it's sunny and I was with the family, then I would go to the beach. And the third case there consists of that I don't care whether I, the, what the weather is like, if uh, there's no family with me, then I'm going to go fishing. Jeffrey, uh, you described this obviously as a trivial example, the Sunday one, but, but in general, do you have the capacity within a PC to, to seriously approach this kind of problem solving? Yes, you can do uh, quite significant things. As a matter of fact, I've recently been speaking with the Whole Earth Software Review people about doing some systems to recommend software, such as word processing programs or communications hardware modems, that sort of thing. Niels, uh, I want to ask you what I hope doesn't sound like a dumb question, but kind of what's the point? Uh, why do we develop something like this kind of system? Is it to replace the doctor, say, in the diagnosis situation? What, what is the end result of this? Well, I think there'd be a lot of uses of systems like this. I think the present ones actually do have a lot of uh, brittle features that perhaps uh, might limit their utility at the present time. But uh, in the long run, that is 10 years, 20 years, something like that, uh, these kinds of, of systems, I think, will be quite generally useful in a wide range of uh, settings. First of all, um, the knowledge that uh, these systems contain, at least we hope to put in the knowledge of world-class experts, people uh, who know so much about the field that there might only be five or six of them in the whole world who know that much. Now, uh, there can be some pretty good practicing people who nevertheless aren't quite as good as the world uh, experts in a particular subject. So it helps us spread the knowledge of an expert uh, around a good deal in a way which can be copied quite easily. Okay, in just a moment we're going to meet the man who invented the term artificial intelligence and we'll see a demonstration of knowledge engineering. That's coming up next. Joining us now is Tom Kaler. Tom is Director of Applied Artificial Intelligence at Intelligenetics. Tom, uh, you've got a complex system here. First of all, tell me how this would be different from the system we saw in the first part of the program. Well, one way is, uh, that it's different is that we can develop a graphics environment which connects to the underlying knowledge basis so that the uh, user really is just uh, fooling around with meters and valves and, and objects that they're used to. Here, for example, if we look at this levelometer, we can just point to it. Uh, before you get to that, what, what's the environment we're looking at here? Oh, this is the 